teachers and a warm welcome to our special guest speaker, Mr. Michael um, Bachelard. Uh, now, Mr. Michael is currently the correspondent of Indonesia's um, of, um, for of Indonesia for Australia's The Age newspaper. In the past, he worked he worked as a political writer and works pla- works sorry workplace relations writer, and we can find his political news on the Age's website. For that, he won a Jefferson Fellowship Award in 2005. Aside from journalism, he he has written a book entitled Behind the Exclusive uh, Breton, which discusses the Australian politics in 2004. Now, let's have Mr. Michael on stage, listening, sorry, <laughs> along with Chris, who will interview him. First question is, I understand that you work for the H newspaper yes. as a correspondent here in Indonesia. So could you please uh, elaborate how you came about that? Okay, well, uh, the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, which is the sister newspaper in Sydney, have uh, about, uh, have got eight correspondents around the world. Uh, people whose job it is to feed information back to Australia from things that are happening around the world. Uh, Indonesia is of great interest to Australia. And so uh, in 2011, I was given the job to uh, to come here and, uh, and report to uh, Australia oh. about Indonesia. I replaced the previous correspondent. We've had a correspondent here for many years, uh, the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, Uh, had one uh, when Suharto was still uh, in power and then at one point they were uh, kicked out from the country uh, but came back again in uh, the early 2000s to cover, in fact, perhaps even before that, to cover Reformasi. And since then we've had a permanent correspondent here and I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the lucky one <laughs> for now. So back in university before you started the age and everything, yeah. what did you study in AMU? As I believe. Yeah, I, I went to the Australian National University. I studied English literature and history. Uh, I never studied journalism. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I learned how to do journalism as I worked for a newspaper, uh, but I got a job uh, straight from my arts degree. Oh. So what drew you towards journalism and investigative reporting? Yeah, well, uh, look, I always enjoyed writing, uh, and... What I discovered when I became a journalist was that I also really enjoyed uh, researching, uh, meeting people, interviewing people, finding out things that nobody else knows yet yeah. until I tell them about it, uh, and putting together a story, informing people. I think it's a very important uh, role in, uh, in democracy, particularly if people need to vote about uh, uh, you know, who their leader would be. They need to know about the issues that are important and that affect them. And journalism is the best way, the, really the only way that people on a mass scale learn about uh, the things that are important in their society. So I think it's a very important job and uh, one that I, I feel I can do and I can contribute to my society. So that's what drew me to, to doing this investigative journalism. All journalism should be yeah. investigative. All journalism should look for the answer to why this is happening or who's behind it or what you know what's really going on not just what you're told and uh, so of course if you are a good journalist you should investigate of course so who did you model yourself after starting off your career as a journalist did you have like an idol in mind or um, not an individual but there was some newspapers in Australia that were very uh, good that I used to read when I was a child uh, there was a newspaper called the National Times very uh, many investiga- investigations, long stories, features, very ex- explained what was going on in Australia and why, and I, I admired that. I wanted to be like that. You wanted to be like that? Yeah. Okay. So how long have you been a correspondent here? Uh, nearly three years. Three years. I started at the beginning of 2012. Okay. Uh, but I, unfortunately, I only have a few months left. I must go back to Australia in, Jan- in January. Oh, wow. Are you planning to go somewhere else after Indonesia as a correspondent as well? Or? Well, that would be nice, but uh, <laughs> I have to uh, earn that job from the uh, from the company. Perhaps I don't know if Andrew is listening, but uh, uh, 
Um, Andrew's my editor-in-chief, perhaps uh, you know, he can give me another job as, an, as a correspondent. But look, many people want to be a correspondent. It's a very, uh, very good job, a very prestigious job. You have a lot of freedom uh, and a lot of responsibility, so it's a hard job to get. Okay. So as a, as a professional journalist, as a um, senior journalist, what are the, some challenging aspects that you face? Um, for me, the challenges here in Indonesia are trying... There are many, of course. It's a, it's a big, confusing country. Um, trying to, ver- to, to verify information I'm given, to make sure it's true before I report it, is always a challenge. Uh, I have to sometimes go to multiple sources or to find sources that I really trust. Um, making sure that what I'm telling my audience, who are Australians, what is interesting to, to them. It's, I, could write, I could write a lot of stories about negotiations between uh, Jokowi and uh, uh, you know, Golka about, about who forms the next coalition, but to be honest, my audience is not interested. So I have to find the stories that they're interested in. And if there's a story that's really important, I think it's important that they're not interested in, I have to find a way to make it interesting for them. So, uh, you know, those are some of the some of the challenges. Some some challenges are just logistic. How do I get to this place? How do I make sure that uh, you know I want to interview that kind of person? Well, How do I find that person? So travel mostly. Yeah. Well, no, it's more it's the travel actually. Well, the travel. Yeah. You know what the highways are like yeah. here, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's more finding the right person who can give me the story that illuminates an issue. So do you have actually any Indonesian audiences as opposed to Australian audiences? I'm sure there are some people who read what I write online. Okay. In fact, uh, during the course of the election campaign, I've probably doubled my number of Twitter followers, and most of them are, are Indonesian. Are Indonesian. Because I've been to, say, the protest rally last week outside NCAR, uh, I was there, I was tweeting live from there and okay. sending photographs and so on. So, so many people followed me. Or I was at a Palestine, uh, Palestine rally recently where probably addressed the rally, I took a picture, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I took a picture of uh, somebody from FPE waving an ISIS flag, and I tweeted that, and that was retweeted a thousand times, so many, so, so yes, I do have some Indonesian audience, but okay. mostly it's Australian. Mostly Australian. Oh, okay. Do you have any other publications that you write for aside from Australian newspapers, or... Is it just mainly for Australia? It's just for Australia. But, but of course, it's on all my... Everything I publish goes online, so anybody can see it anywhere in the world. And, you know, we do get people from anywhere in the world looking. Yeah, of course. So, furthermore, uh, as a foreign correspondent, what methods do you find most valuable when conducting research mm. uh, prior to writing your articles, especially with content regarding Indonesia? Yeah, well, the, look, by absolute a million miles, the most useful thing is going out into the field and interviewing people. Yeah. about their lives. This morning, before I came here, uh, I'm working on a story about uh, uh, Af- refugees from Afghanistan wanting to come to Australia, and, and often they come to Indonesia first so they can try to get to Australia. There's 10,000 people waiting here to try to get to Australia as refugees, and some of them have run out of money. So I went to the UNHCR office in Jalan Kebon City this morning, and I met a guy, and he said, come and see where I sleep, and he took me across the road to the the, the side of the road near the, the drain and he said this is here's my bed here's my friend we sleep here because I have no money so finding people who are uh, living an experience uh, that I'm interested in that's the, the best way to find out information of course you also have to talk to authorities police uh, you know um, uh, search and rescue yeah. their boat sinks or something like that and Sometimes you can do that on the phone, but uh, it's better with it. Going out into the field is the best way to get oh. information. Yeah. So before you were working here as a journalist, where did you work? Uh, I worked in Melbourne, um, which is uh, the age. The age is based in Melbourne. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald is in Sydney, yeah. <laughs> but they're in the same company. So when I file my stories, that it goes to both okay. both places. But I live in Melbourne. You live in Melbourne, okay. Yeah. So you've never been in any other country aside from Indonesia? Well, I've visited, but this is the first place I've been to as a correspondent. As a correspondent? Yeah. Okay. okay. Do you see yourself working as a journalist for a while, or do you have any other aspirations in mind after this? Look, I can't think of any other job I would rather do. There's, there's, uh, journalism is a 
it's a fantastic job and I'm very lucky. I think my job, Indonesia correspondent for Fairfax, I think my job is maybe the best job in journalism in Australia, actually. It's uh, the most interesting, the most freedom, uh, the most fascinating place. Yeah. And uh, it's, I'm very lucky. So uh, I think uh, when I go back to Australia, I will still want to be a journalist. Yeah. But being a journalist, like, are the deadlines really hard to push? Or, like, yeah. It is. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, particularly, and may I say this about your country. Yeah. May I say it. Everything is late. When MK gives a decision about the election, what time? It's 9 p.m. Yeah. Well, that's midnight in Mostly. Sydney and Melbourne. So, obviously, it's too late for my newspaper. Yeah. So, I, I have to sit up until midnight and I write my story and uh, it goes online. But, you know, okay. when Kape U says, Jokowi wins, it's 10, 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Why is that? Why is everything so late here? It's just, it's just a culture, I guess. Yeah. So uh, it's a three-hour time difference, uh, which means that often I have to file my stories if I'm if I'm writing for the newspaper. Yeah. I have to file my story at shortly after uh, lunchtime. Okay. So uh, that can be quite stressful, particularly if some big story is happening, a breaking story. Uh, you know, the news is changing all the time. Yeah. Finding what point do I say? This is how I tell the story. Because I know, even after I've finished it, there's still going to be more events and more events. The way I deal with that is to file something for my print edition, but then, as the story keeps going, I still keep filing different versions for online, okay. right up until, well, we have people online 24 hours a day. I can file any time of day. And so, if people care to look online, they can find the latest version of what's happening. Since you've been a journalist for a long time, and... With the current um, technological advances in today's modern society, how do you adapt to that? How, how did you transist from being a journalist just writing for a newspaper and mm. then starting your Twitter account? How did you do that? Look, that's a, it's a really good question, and it's probably the most pressing question in modern journalism, uh, particularly for newspapers. How do you go from being something that's printed on paper and released once a day yeah. to being something that is moving all the time yeah. like uh, like news mu- news moves all the time yeah. you asked me about how I adapted well when I came to Indonesia I had to learn how to shoot video I, I was given a camera uh, I now take I take all my own photographs I uh, almost all I shoot video all the time and I put together video packages so that with my stories in print there's often also a video, and if it's something, a news event happening, I can videotape that and file it, give a commentary, and uh, and that goes up online as well. So uh, Twitter, uh, I find uh, useful because it yeah, helps course. me yeah. distill my thinking about a story as I go along. I've had to become somebody who can comment on radio. Uh, I'm very often, Australian radio stations ring me up and say, you're there, what's going on? And I'm, I'm on the phone commenting on the radio so it truly is these days uh, you have to be um, across many different kinds of media yeah of course is Twitter the only thing you're on right now online or aside oh, from the website yeah well, I mean I have a Facebook account of course oh, but, okay. uh, but Twitter is my favourite way of releasing my uh, minute to minute observations yeah. oh, okay. it's a, it's a I, I mean uh, Indonesians can't get enough of Twitter so uh, <laughs> so if I if I'm producing content all the time for Twitter then uh, you know that, that that information is shared very widely okay so being a journalist here what topics do you are you most interested in in writing your articles <clears throat> on uh, well I'm a journalist here but I'm, a, I'm Australian yeah. and I'm writing for an Australian audience so all my almost all my stories have to have some application to Australia, whether it's, it's a really important story for Indonesia, like the presidential election. Uh, I wrote maybe 20 stories about the Indonesian election, the, the presidential election, from profiles of Jokowi and Prabowo to uh, uh, summaries of what happened on the day, down to protests, you know, and yeah. I covered the announcements of MK and KPL. So that was, uh, uh, you know... That's a, an Indonesian story, yeah. but it's important for Australia yeah, yeah. as well. But then there's stories, for example, the relationship between Indonesia and Australia that broke down over spying, 
uh, the, the, the spy, uh, when Australia spied on SBA and his wife and sorry, family. Yeah. That was a big story for us because uh, Indonesia punished Australia. So that was a very big story last year and the, I'm going to Bali tomorrow uh, because they're signing an agreement now to, to end that issue. So it's a mix between what's important for Australians to know about Indonesia and what uh, Australian interests in Indonesia are. So I understand you're a journalist also on the field, right? Mm. Is it dangerous, you know, being in that kind of environment? It can be, it can be. Uh, I was uh, threatened, uh, I've been threatened several times actually with uh, uh, at FPE rallies, really? uh, people chanting, will they go home, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a guy had a, pointed a slingshot at me. Uh, really? On my head. <laughs> um, uh, I've been tear gassed twice since I've been here. Um, and I've been threatened also over a story I wrote about Papua. Uh, but that would be to... Just taking those examples would be to vastly overrate the danger. You know, mostly, almost all the time in Indonesia, I feel totally safe. It's okay. a very friendly country. In fact, the day that the, uh, the guy from FPE threatened me... Yeah. Three other guys from FPE came and stood between me and him and said, don't do this. Really? So, you know, there's the contradiction of Indonesia is that uh, the guys from the same group will both threaten me and help me. Okay. So what are your views on the differences between Australian journalism and Indonesian journalism? Look, there are, there are a few. I think um, Indonesian journalism is, uh, you know... I go down to uh, Jokowi's office, okay, and there are 30 journalists sitting there, yeah. and they sit there all day, okay. So, and they sit there in the heat and on the hard floor, and they're just waiting for him to come in or out so they can interview. And if in, uh, you know, uh, government departments or parliament, there's always a large group of journalists sitting there. Um, in Australia, there's many fewer journalists. Uh, it's much, it's it's better organised, so that you know, if Jokowi is going to, sorry, if the say the, the Prime Minister of Australia wants to say something to the media, yeah. he will send out an alert. I'll be here at this time, and everybody gathers at this time. So there's much less time wasted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the salaries are higher. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a well paid job in Australia. Um, and I think also the um, I find that in Australia you get more analysis about what's going on, more explanation about events, more background. In Indonesia, it seems that the journalism is very much this happened, and then tomorrow this other thing happened, and then tomorrow this thing happened. But there's not very there's not very many people who are looking at all of those things and pulling it together and saying this is what it means. Oh. And so I found during the presidential election, for example, it was I was a little bit frustrated by the fact that uh, the background of uh, Prabowo yeah. and the uh, people who were with him in his coalition, you know, the beef mafia, the Hajj mafia, yeah. the you know, there was very little explanation or commentary about that in Indonesia. A lot of that was in the Western press, actually. Okay. Did you write anything about that? Uh, ye yes, uh, not specifically about the mafias. Actually, yeah. I, I did write something about the mafias, but <laughs> I, it didn't get into the newspaper for legal reasons. But, oh, okay. uh, it was, um, uh, but uh, you know, it's pri not primarily my job. It's you know, it's Indonesians' job to explain to other Indonesians what's going on. So I, I find the Indonesian media, I think, maybe uh, needs to more resources into better paid journalism so that they can be more thoughtful yeah. and more... Um, they do more work. Well, more, well they, they work hard. They, yeah. they work really hard. They're everywhere, all the time. They work very hard. But, but is it, it's not always productive work, I think. Um, so do you think in today's modern society there's a certain biasness for journalists when they're writing their articles? Do you mm. think they pick more towards one side rather than becoming neutral? Look, that's again an interesting question. Um, 
Yes, that's certainly the case, and we saw it in the again in the presidential election. Some newspapers very much pro. In fact, I think most newspapers pro Jocko. Yeah. Um, and the other side uh, uh, had uh, fewer supporters in the media, and it was uh, except but on TV, TV One, yeah. uh, quite quite different. You know, yeah. you could get a, a totally different view of the world. So I think there was a lot of bias exhibited in in the Indonesian media, and the, the same the same thing happens in Australia, in the US, in the so UK. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So. I don't think that's a good thing, yeah. but but I think we have to at, at least have, um, as journalists, question our own bias and try to present things as they are okay. as much as we can. And then make, you can make comments on that, but, yeah. but to, to tell people the things as they are, as they see them, most honestly as, they, as you can. I think that's important and... I agree. I think the world is moving away from that direction a little bit. Okay. So do you, you see it increasing, though? Yeah. Well, I, I see in Australia certainly. I see it in the US. Fox News, uh, you know, is totally biased one way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, in in the UK, it's been a long time. You have your, your left wing newspapers and your right wing newspapers, and totally different worldview. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think it's a good development. So I understand that you wrote a book entitled, as my colleague said, uh, "Behind the Exclusive Brethren," yeah. and it became a bestseller in Australia as a sort of expose on the religious sect that was then bursting on the political stage during the Howard government. Yeah. So, what interested you about them, and what motivated you to do to go into this extensive two-year investigation? Yeah. To write this book. Look, it was just an act of journalism, really. Uh, I mean, my editor came to me one morning and he said, "You." You know, there's this group. They're trying to influence the election in New Zealand, okay. and the Australia was having an election at around that time. He said, "Just go and find out if they're trying to influence the Australian election." Yeah. And I went out and I found out that they were. Yeah. And I wrote a story, and then my phone just kept ringing with people who used to be part of this religious group. Yeah. And uh, it. Uh, they kept telling me these terrible stories about how badly they'd been treated and how they couldn't see their children anymore and so on. And uh, I just kept writing stories and I wrote more and more stories until I had enough knowledge that I, I had to write a book. So, <laughs> so then I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. how, many, how many articles do you think you've written over the years as a journalist? You mean in total? Yeah, I like could, around about. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't guess. I couldn't guess. Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, let's say 200 articles a week. 200 articles? Sorry, sorry, 200 articles. Sorry, I beg your pardon. 200 articles a year? A year, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, no, that, that would be unreal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you intimidated them there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 200 a week, easy. <laughs> 200 a year, say 250 a year, and I've been a journalist. Since 1990, so that's Thanks, what you know, 2000. That's 25 years. Yeah. Can somebody wow. do the math there? 200 articles times 25. Yeah. About that. Say, let's just say <laughs> a lot of articles. A lot of articles. <laughs> the reason why we're art students. Yeah. Math is not strong. Yeah. Look, I work. I work very hard. I work very hard. But you know, I've been given privilege. My organisation sends me here. They spend a lot of money to give me a house and uh, to give me an office and an assistant, and it's my responsibility to do to work as hard as I can for three years so that I can hopefully earn my my my, my keep earn my keep. That's what I'm doing. But when you go around and everything, as you said earlier, you you do have a translator. Yeah. Okay. And is that for every city, or is that like yeah, one have, that you yeah. bring around? I have one in Jakarta. I have one in Bali because Bali is such a big story for Australia. Eight hundred thousand Australian tourists in Bali every year. Yeah. Wow. You know, fifteen or fifteen or so Australians in Balinese prisons, uh, and one Chappelle Corby. That's you know, that's yeah. uh, that justifies me having a translator just in Bali. Just in Bali. So, uh, but I have one other, and so I travel. I'm. My translator here in Jakarta, mostly I travel with her when I go to wherever. Okay. But being a Western journalist, when you go around the smaller 
um, villages in Indonesia are they less cooperative into no that's one, one of the wonderful things about Indonesia is how cooperative people are oh, okay people love to um, tell their stories okay and uh I try to respect that by telling their stories as honestly as I can. Yeah. But I think sometimes being a, it's particularly in the small villages, yeah. being a bullet I think sometimes helps oh, okay. because people kind of, you know, <laughs> bullet. So they like to kind of sometimes to, to, to cooperate. Yeah. Is it different between cities and everything, or is um, it in Jakarta a bit more difficult to interview people? Yeah. Well, Jakarta. I don't have any better um, access to government in Jakarta. In fact, probably less access in, to government people than Indonesian journalists. That's the way it should be. But I don't get special. I don't really get special treatment. Um, but uh, yeah, outside it's it's uh, outside Jakarta. I do. I stand out. So it's uh, maybe a bit easier. <laughs> do Do you meet a lot of Western journalists as you're doing your investigative reporting around Indonesia, or Yeah, um, there is uh, four Australian journalists based here in uh, from Australian media organisations, all based in Deutsche Bank building just across the road. And um, so they, we are we compete with each other, but we also like each other. We we get on well, so we often will we will all be in Bali tomorrow for this uh, code of conduct signing. So we'll have. We'll have dinner together, probably. So, oh, okay. But if I go out in, investigating a, a story out, yeah. you know, in Surabaya or in Dromayu or you know, Sulawesi or Kalimantan, yeah. uh, I, I'm by myself. Okay. With, Are there usually clashes in the stories you guys make? Or? No, no. I mean, we compete. We try. We try very hard to be the best, to get the best angle, to get more information, to get the story fastest. We compete, but it's friendly competition. It's a very good yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, we'd be like people from Kalan Tempo and Raka Medeka. They would all know each other. You know, they would they would have uh, coffee together and talk together. But then, when they come to file their stories, they would be trying to get to get a better story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, coming to my last question, mm-hmm. do you have any advice for any as- aspiring young journalists here in the room today? Oh, good question. Uh, think about that. Look, I think my advice would be simply what I said before, which is if you want to be a journalist in Indonesia, I think there is still uh, room for Indonesian journalism to get better. So mm-hmm. Journalism is so important for democracy, yeah? Yeah. and the the press here is fabulously vibrant and aggressive and. It does all the things it should do, yeah. except I think for for one thing, which is to try to uh, pull the meaning the meaning out of stories, not just the events, but the meaning. So I think if it, if you guys are wanting to be clearly, you are you're getting a, a, a good education. You you know you speak English. You are um, you know thoughtful and tertiary educated. You should be. If you're going into journalism, you should be the people who are aiming to be the best journalists. And I think to to, in, to investigate, to find out what is really going on behind a story, and then to explain that story uh, is something that uh, I think uh, would be very, very valuable for Indonesian democracy and Indonesian society. Well, thank you so much for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we can just um, take some questions just from anybody. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions for Michael? I have a few, but I want you guys to kind of, you know, go first. Yeah. Stephen, uh, you mentioned how Indonesian covers of news such as uh, the Kapi Ru uh, release was late in 10 p.m. etc. But you also mentioned right after that question. How you use Twitter to, as your everyday minute-to-minute update, yeah. Yeah. and I believe like many other Indonesian students as well. So how do you like use such social media as a form of news scattering since it's more up to date than what you would get from yeah. you know reports and such? Well, there's two two things Twitter is useful for. One is me putting out my view, and the other is me seeing what other people are saying. 
as well. And so, uh, I, and I use it for both. I've, I quote tweets. I quoted tweets uh, in my stories. Uh, there's a, a guy, uh, Philippe Vermont, there who uh, analyses politics here, and he tweeted some comments in the last week of the election campaign about how Indonesians don't want to vote for Jokowi because he's uh, an ordinary person. This was when it looked like Prabowo might win. And I, I quoted that tweet. So it's, it's useful both ways. Um, look, for me, Twitter is not my main job. Uh, it's useful and interesting and fun. And so I try to tweet things that my followers will be interested in. So uh, when I was up at the uh, MCAR uh, protest, the Prabowo protest, you know, I took a picture of a guy who was selling sunglasses. You know, there's, uh, there's um, you know, all these uh, automats were there and there's big trucks and there's razor wire and there's police with tear gas and there's a guy selling sunglasses. And I thought, this is, this is entrepreneurialism, this is Indonesian, you know, this is so typical. There's all these little, tiny little women, she was about this tall, walking around selling Nazi bunkers, you know. So uh, I tweeted that. And just with a photo of this guy and said, you know, in Indonesian entre- entrepreneurialism knows no fear. <laughs> and it was retweeted 560 times because some, for some reason that appealed to people. So I, I, make, I try to make it funny and, but to, to make observations. Um, it's just a, it's a really useful way of just making small observations out of a situation that but you may never report it. You might never get into your story, but it's it tells you something about that situation. Yeah. Do you think that riots here are usually overblown? Riots? Riots, you know, like mass gatherings and everything. I would say the only time I've seen one get out of control, properly out of control, is the FPE rally that I told you about uh, when... Uh, that was when the, the film Innocence of Muslims yeah. was released. Oh, and yes. There was a great deal of anger, yeah. and they went to the American embassy. But then, that was about then, wasn't it? Sorry? How long was that? That was 2012, I think. Yeah. yeah. So they marched from Hawaii up to the U.S. embassy, yeah. and uh, the tear gas and uh, you know the slingshots, and it was quite frightening. But that's the only time I've seen it out of control. At the Prabowo rally, yeah. you know, these guys uh, from FKPPI or uh, BM, these yeah. all masks with uniforms on, uniforms, uh, they were chatting to me. One of them was saying, oh, yeah, my, my daughter, she's in Sydney, she's at university, you know. <laughs> By the way, you should probably go off the back because it's going to get nasty soon. Um, you know, just... So they're nice. Be careful. I find Indonesian people so... <laughs> Even the bad guys are good guys, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a quote. Cool. Yeah. That's a cool. that's a cool. Except for the really bad guys. They're, they're really bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, earlier you mentioned about how you would write for the online edition and for the print edition as well. And how you also mentioned about how you worked with videos and uh, video cameras and stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you think, like, in today's journalism, that there is such a distinction between the traditional way of, of being a journalist and, and um, the ways of online journalism or is it all just clumped up together into journalism and this is what you have to know today? Well, it's, uh, look, it's changing so fast. Um, for now, uh, uh, the, the organisation I work for, Fairfax, is a serious... Uh, it's interested in serious journalism. Okay, So the values... Uh, of journalism that we have are still really the values of the old style print the news- newspaper journalism So, and we still in a sense we still work to that template if I want to write uh, a feature story I, you know, I'm looking at somewhere between 1500 and 2500 words because that's what fits on a newspaper page and, and so we still think like that, we still think this is the level of quality the level of um, uh, uh, truth, you know, the, of verification that we need, and so on. Uh, and yet, there's this whole other side of our operation, which is fast. Give me now, and if you get it wrong, we can we can correct it later. And that's really valuable because, of course, people want to know what's going on right now. And in the old days, you would turn on the radio to find out what was going on, or you know, but even before 24-hour TV channels. 
radio was the most immediate. Now we're all trying to compete for immediacy as well. So uh, for now, I am everything. You know, I'm video, I'm photo, I'm radio, I'm I'm wire service. Like you know, I, I write quickly for online. I'm feature writing for newspaper. You know, uh, and actually, I, I really like that because it's a, a really interesting mix. But uh, are we? There's a there's a question: Are we compromising our old values of? only being totally sure about something before you report it. Are we trading that for being immediate? And I think we are a little bit. Um, but that's what that's the way journalism is moving. I think I think now you need to need to be more versatile than than one than before. And for me I, I like that. Does that mean you get less sleep and everything? <laughs> <laughs> So how, how is that? You know? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess in the old days I would file at 2pm 2, 2 because that's the print deadline. And then uh, the rest of the day is mine. Well, for me, I would probably then work on a feature for the next day. But, you know, even so, I'd go home at 5. And if something happened at 7, I would go, OK, that's interesting. I'll see how that goes overnight and then when I wake up tomorrow, I'll write it for tomorrow. But now, if something happens at 7, I'm there, I'm on my computer, I'm writing it, I file at 7.30, okay. and then I update at 9, and then I update again at midnight, yeah. and now I go to bed. So, yeah, I mean, it's... So it's all right. It's, well, it's okay, but you work oh, hard. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you work hard. But, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, addi- it's addictive. You know, it's like a drug. You can't, you can't see something happening and not... Tell right about it. You can't not tell a story. So how many sources do you have? Like, I, oh, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, uh, like, you know, I get I got a new source this morning. I went out into the field this morning at 7 o'clock and I met a guy in a while and he told me his story. He's a, I got his number. He says, that, that might be him texting me now. <laughs> so I have a source, a new source. I, I have countless but I'm not talking to each of them yeah. all the time. It's, yeah. it's just. You know. But you don't use like a Reuters kind of thing. You just no. use different people up everywhere you go. Yeah, of course I watch what other people are reporting. Yeah, and if I have to, I try and find the person they've quoted because that that's the story I want as well. Yeah. Uh, but um, most often it's just I try to find my own okay. people to quote. Uh, the population for Muslims in Indonesia and Australia is largely different with like, yep. in Indonesia composes of 95% while in Australia it's only 2% so yep. most of the news and issues that are revolving around Indonesia will most likely be Muslim related yep. and how do you think it's a challenge for your Australian audience who whose Muslim population is not as significant to be interested in those kinds of stuff? Well, actually, Australia's population is probably more interested in uh, Islam, matters about Islam, than, than they should be, really. As you say, it's only 2% of the population. But um, ISIS, uh, or Islamic State, um, the issues around terrorism, uh, there is a... Um, how do I say? Uh, there is a lot of fear in Australia about Islam. Uh, and people in Australia confuse the religion with terrorism. Okay, so and there are some commentators in Australia who deliberately confuse them because uh, making people scared will sell their newspaper. Okay, so part of my job is to tell people that. Uh, uh, well, it's not. I'll rephrase that. Part of my job is to give a realistic um, picture of uh, of Indonesia, and Islam obviously is part of Indonesia, a large, important part. So if <coughs> if FAE is <coughs> is doing stupid things, I'll report that. If the government here is refusing to stop them doing stupid things, I'll report that. But if uh, uh, if the Muhammadiyah and NU speak out against 
Abu Bakr Bashir or the Islamic State or ISIS, I will put that. And then I'll explain that the, the, the kind of Islam in Indonesia is mostly very calm and very uh, moderate. So, that's, again, it's the same thing. Telling the truth as close as I can, as much as I can telling the truth, but in a way that is relevant to Australian people. As I've noted, there's a segment of Indonesia in Aceh that supports the ISIS. Did you interview or write up anything about that? I, I, I could only find one guy, uh, Ahmad, I can't remember his name now, but he, he runs a uh, website which is the kind of main website for ISIS in Indonesia. Really? So I interviewed him. Um, but I, and I tried to interview somebody who was going off to fight. But be, but that the same week, uh, ISIS had been banned in Indonesia, and the, the sources I found suddenly they didn't want to talk to me because they were scared of being arrested, so of people being arrested. So that that became difficult. But I did. Uh, I have uh, interviewed at least I sort of I've interviewed Abu Bakar Bashir uh, by by writing. And I've, inter- I've been down to Nguruki School in Solo and interviewed his son. Um, so I, I do try, as I say, I try to find people from every angle of a story yeah. and to find out their, their view. And most of these people don't mind. You just Sometimes it's hard. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time to convince them. Sometimes they say no. But uh, it's... But what are the techniques that you use to convince people if they don't? Well, it's always worth asking. Just to ask, you know, just ask. Like, for example, I, uh, two years ago, uh, when the anniversary of Bombardi, yeah. I interviewed uh, uh, a guy called Id- Idris, who was one of the bombers. He'd, he'd been in jail, but he got out. Uh, and he was living, living in Pekinbaru, and I went and interviewed him. And it took me a long time to convince him. Um... But some people here, often they want to tell their stories. So you just tell them, you know, people in Australia are inter- interested, I'll fly up there, I'll, I'll interview you, we can, you know. Um, you can tell me in your own words how you feel about things. Um, so usually when you're involved in that kind of case? No, well, no, we have a policy of not paying. Not paying. So, so do, are they willing? They're mostly willing. Yeah, I mean, as I say, sometimes they need convincing. And sometimes they say no. What, one way if somebody's unwilling to be interviewed is to get somebody they know and interview them, and then they can say, "Well, this guy, he's okay. You know, the, you know, he's not aggressive or nasty. You know, you should, you know, and, and get get their friend to convince them. Oh, okay. That's you know, uh, but in the end, you can't do it if you can't make somebody. Yeah, of course, you can't just force them. You can't yeah. force them. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that there's a policy about not paying. Like, do you have any personal morals or ethics in journalistic that you yes, sure. might follow? Like, you do, you never go to this extent to report on something. You never go to this extent to investigate. My, my main my main ethic is try not to lie, uh, but sometimes. So, I I, I am usually exactly up front with people about what I want and so on and where I come from and and where it will be, will be published and how and that kind of thing. But there are sometimes sometimes to catch a bad guy you need to maybe be a little bit um, uh, secret. So uh, I have a I have a little camera uh, in a pen which I can sometimes hide, which I can hide, and which I can, you know, interview people. But uh, that's very, very rare. I only do that if if I know that they will tell me, no, you can't, but I really want to get a response from them. So, uh, and maybe, maybe, um, I can't think of the last time I did that. I can't think of the last time I did that. It was a, would have been a long time ago. But sometimes, very occasionally, that's necessary. But that's not illegal. Not as far as I know, no. (laughs) It's actually, it would be illegal in some states in Australia and not in other states. 
Okay. But uh, here, I don't think it's illegal. Okay. Something illegal is about clock folks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like so many things here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, on that issue, I just want to. I have one question. Um, you mentioned earlier that there were some of the articles you have written in the past that has not been published uh, for legal reasons. I was wondering whether you actually bear these issues in mind when you write something. Do you write in such a way that the truth has got to go out there, uh, or, or do you write it with, with the idea that okay, I've got to make sure I don't get sued or something? Like that? Yeah, well, it's a balance. It's a, you know, journalism is always a balance between saying what you know and what you think may have happened and uh, and what you can get away with, what you can do without being sued. Um, so, of, of course, journalists will always try to push it right up to the very limit edge. And uh, my newspaper organisation has lawyers full-time who, who can see, tell you, well, this is where the edge is, that is where the edge is. Um, but I will usually write whatever, whatever I think. And, and if they say mm, you can't write that, then I'll let them tell me that. Uh, but of course, you bear in mind. And, and of course, in the end, in, in Australia, if you've told the truth and you can prove that that's the truth, uh, then that's enough. You can defend yourself against a, a lawsuit because if you can prove that what I said is true, then uh, the lawsuit fails. Um, and actually, I'm somebody suing me right now, and I'm, uh, I have to go back sometime to Australia to go to a court, and uh, because I told the truth, but they deny it. They don't think I did, and I have to then go to the court and prove that it's true. So it's not flawless, but it's uh, you, you, you do what you can get away with. Does that happen often? This is the first time I've been sued, and I've been journalist for 25 years. Oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I ah, yeah. I, I've had many. Uh, the exclusive brethren yeah. about the book. They sent me many, many letters saying, "We're going to see you. We're going to see you. Don't say you can't say this. We're going to see you." And that book actually was written very carefully for that reason. Uh, but um, but that again, that's actually yeah, that's right. But they, they are done again. They're threatening me again because I've, I've been on TV talking about them again and they're threatening me again so I don't know, maybe I'll get another one. <laughs> um, I think as you mentioned before there are six correspondents around the world from the eight. Yeah. Uh, did you choose to come here or did they send you? Uh, well, p- partly, well, yeah, I chose to come here. Uh, when my the, pre- the, the previous correspondent, when his job finished in end of 2011 they had uh, they asked for people to apply for the job and I applied. I was interviewed and I got the job. Right now, uh, they're doing that for my replacement. Are you still going to be working at the age after this? Or? Yeah, well, I hope so if they give me a job. <laughs> no, they will. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to Melbourne and work for the age. Oh. <clears throat> I was just wondering what the policy on that, um, the hiring or the replacement of foreign correspondents. Um, is there a specific reason why they change every few years? Um, it's it's many many expats here are here for two three four years, not just for foreign correspondents, but for oil companies and you know consulting companies. Uh, and I guess it's because when you first arrived, when I first came here, I went, wow, look, who are those people? And uh, my driver says, oh, they're jockeys. Jockeys? What are they for? Oh, well, this three in one. You have to have three people in the car, so. This lady with a baby, she's two people. It's amazing. I want to write about that. So I wrote about that. Okay, that was my first story. And um, and by three years, I'm here three years. Every day I drive past the jockeys, I just go jockeys. You know? <laughs> it's not amazing, but it's amazing for people in Australia. So somebody will come, my replacement will come, and they'll go. What are they jockeys? You know, <laughs> or there's something that I don't even see anymore. They'll see. You know, so it's good to replace people. What you lose, you, they'll lose uh, something. They'll lose the fact that I know how to get around. I know this. Is, it's it's impossible to get to Chilatap by road. You know, I have to fly there. You know, they'll lose expertise, yeah. but they'll gain fresh eyes. 
and in two or three years' time, the, the guy with fresh eyes or the girl, they'll have expertise as well. So you know, and then that'll change. And yeah, that'll right. So yeah. Sharon's caring. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, it gives other people an opportunity to do the best job in Australian journalism. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other questions? Okay, there are no more questions. Just uh, one last education-related question, yep. at least from me, for, for all these reasons. Because you mentioned earlier, you didn't study journalism at university. You studied literature and history. 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 Yep. How much of that do you manage to bring into what you're doing right now? It's hard to tell. So you, you're all art students, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so you have a, a variety of different uh, things you study. Um I think we're all, all officially communication students. Communications, so, okay. Yeah, sooner or later, we're, they can probably pick their majors yeah. when they go off to Australia in okay. specific areas. But yeah, yeah okay. Well, for me, you know, I probably use my literature background and my history background all the time without even knowing it. It's, just, it's there in the back of my mind. And, you know, it's, uh, it helps me interpret events. Like, uh, you know, re- reading literature is about reading something and interpreting it, extracting the meaning from it. I do that every day here, not just to write my story, but to even work out what stories to write, what would be interesting for people. Well, actually, this is a part that we haven't heard about before. So I'm always using my critical faculties, which I learned during my degree in, in my work, but it's so much part of me now that I don't say, ah, you know, this is, uh, this came from my degree. It's just, you know, uh, research skills, um, writing skills, uh, but the journalism, the kind of interviewing people, uh, the, the style of writing, the difference between news and features, I learned that as I worked on the job. Sorry, this one up the back. Yeah, because um, I'm using like the, this this kind of field, and I don't normally watch news. And when I uh, come to this class, I have to write news and like do like yeah, yeah. this kind of thing. Like, uh, like the sources. How do you get the sources like to write the news? Uh, like like the good news. Like how yeah. do you get like the updated uh, news? Like how do you? Yeah, Okay. Okay. Well, look, this uh, journalism is not just one thing. Obviously, so if an event is happening, the news is obvious. The event is happening. You report what happened. You know, that's kind of you don't need to think too hard about that. And so the you know MK decision, it was on TV. You know, he's the judge. He says this. You report that. Okay. So that's it's pretty straightforward. But fight. But but working out what's news. Apart from that, what the best angle is, that's actually, we call it news sense, news judgment. And it's one of the hardest things about journalism. It's, you know, my news judgment will be different from the guy who works at Rakyat Medeka because their audience is different, their interests are different. So it, it varies between different kinds of journalism. So um, for me, uh, it's the hardest thing. Um, what's going to interest people in Australia out of Indonesia. But once I've worked out, okay, I think this is it. I think this is my angle because I think that's interesting. Okay, so this to working that out, for me, it's what would I tell people if I was if I was with my friends at a Warung and they're saying, what did you do today? I say, you never guess what happened. Blah, 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 blah. That's my angle. It's what interests people because if you're not presenting it in the most interesting way, there's no reason why people should read you. So I try to think, what, how would I put this to my, to my kids or to my friends? So once, once you've decided the angle, then who are the relevant people to, who can illuminate this? So uh, I'm writing a feature right now about uh, this, about, um, it's really about Indramayu, town in West Java, where many, many prostitutes and sex workers come from, come from that village. And to me, the question is, why? Why Indramayu? Why not any other poor village? So what do I do? I go to Indramayu, of course. Uh, I find uh, a girl who's been 
here working in the sex industry? And I ask her, why? And I ask the NGO who works with people. And then I go to, and I think, well, the people who go there and they do sex work, a lot of them are going to end up with sexually sexual diseases, yeah? So let's go to the hospital. So I find some girls who've got HIV from sex work and I talk to them and I ask them, why did you get it? How did you get into it? You know, where, who, who got the money from it? Uh, and how did you end up getting sick? And, and so then I think, oh, okay, well, is there really more HIV AIDS in Indramayu than anywhere else? So I talk to the, the AIDS Council of Indonesia. Okay, and then I think, well, what I really should do is go and find some girls who are working right now in Jakarta. I've got somebody who's about to go. I've got somebody who used to be there. What about right now? So Sunday night I go to Manga Basar and I go to Travel Hotel and I sit there feeling very uncomfortable for an hour kind of watching. And this afternoon at 2 o'clock I'm going with an NGO to interview some girls who are working right now who come from Indra. So I tried to... This is a feature, okay? So I've got a lot of space. I've got 2,500 words to tell this story. So I can talk to a lot of people. Not every story is like that, okay? This is something that will take me a month to research and write. Um, but it's the same thing. This is the, this is the village. Indramayu, this is the village that sells its daughters. That's my angle. That's how I present it to my friends when I sit in the wild. I say, you never guess. Indramayu... This is the village where they sell their daughters. And then, uh, and then I go and try and find out who, why, um, what's their life, what's, what's it like being a prostitute? I'm a bull from Melbourne, I've got no idea. So I try and find out and to get the people to, to put the, the flesh around that story. And it's the same thing with the news story. Here's my angle, okay. What do I need? I need I need a politician from Golkar to tell me about the negotiations. I need a politician from uh, Democrat Party Democrat to tell me why are they where they are. That's simple. I write my story. Yeah, often, always, constantly. I write faster. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, the internet's so helpful because you can just check check facts easily. You, you know, carpet. Well, what does that stand for? What does it stand for? It stands for that. You know, you don't have to make a phone call or something like that. It's fantastic. But mostly, I'm hoping that I'm writing stories. Oh well, and of course, a news story like that, you can you can get quotes from other sources as well, or, or whatever, you know, people talking on TV, you know, you can, you, you can gather information from different, lots of different places, but, you know, I'm hoping to write stories that people don't, haven't already put on the internet, you know, that's fresh and new, so I have to do all that work myself. Thank you. Would you say that journalism is your passion? Would you say that? It's my... Passion. Passion. Uh... Yeah, that and my family. <laughs> uh, but, uh, how did you first find out that when you took English history and literature in yeah. as your university major, how did you first find out? Did you go into the field itself and find yeah. out? Uh, and look, I decided... Was, like, first it, was, like, how do uh, we find that particular question? I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't. Your passion is personal to you only, you know? Uh, I decided when I was 15 that I wanted to be a journalist because I was so impressed by what I read in in this newspaper. And then uh, it was my father told me, don't, don't do a journalism degree. He was a professor uh, at the university. He said, do an arts degree instead. You'll learn more. And so I did that. But I always, I always wanted to go to journalism. So, and then I just tried to find a job. And then I discovered, yeah, actually, I was right. I will be passionate about this. But maybe that was a year or two after I started being a journalist. So, but you know, my, my brother, my brother, he discovered his passion when he was 30 or 35. My sister, maybe the same age. I was lucky I discovered it when I was 15. It's, uh, you know, and some people work their whole lives in jobs that they don't like, that they're not passionate about. 
but she earns them a living. So I, I can't give you any advice on that. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good interview. Good questions. Thanks, Michael. You should think about journalism as a career. Yeah. <laughs>